Okay, thank you very much. Um, as, as mentioned, Ganetti is managing clusters, so uh, let's recall what a cluster is in Ganetti terms. Um, the whole point of a cluster is to have some virtual machines. That's the reason why you operate the whole cluster. In Ganetti terms, they're called instances because the instance of some service or some prototypical machine. Uh, of course, you need to have physical machines to run the whole thing on, which in Ganetti terms are called nodes. Uh, you use some form of hypervisor. Xen is the traditional one. KVM is currently very popular. And as mentioned, LXC is coming, at least an experimental version. And you have some storage, either plain volumes or but the traditional one is using DRBD, so distributed replicated block device. I mean, you have two copies of each disk. And Ganetti helps to manage that. So the first part is it's a lot of convenience because it provides you a uniform interface to all the various hypervisors, to all the various storage solutions you might be using. It also helps you to keep the, the physical nodes used at equal rate and enforce some policies and keep track of little things like, oh, don't, please don't run my two name servers on the same physical node and things like that. And it also helps you to stay in a good state. So part of the reason why you have redundant storage is that you can cope with one node breaking. So then Ganetti will providing commands to fail over the instances rebalance the cluster afterwards, the, the remaining of the clusters. Also has a watcher to keep out for nodes being power cycled without you, you planning it and then re at least restarting the instances and things like that. Also at the policy level, it already takes care of possible failure modes because if you use DRBD as a storage solution, you typically have two nodes where you have a copy of the disks so it's, if one node breaks, you have one node where you can start the instance immediately, and you better have enough memory reserved for the instance to fail over so that you can start without too much of a hassle. Okay, so how does it look and feel? Basic interaction with Ganetti is you start by initializing a cluster. So you provide the command cluster init. You provide the name of the cluster. And that name is not just a name to refer to it, but it is supposed to resolve to a valid IP address, which is the IP under which you then always reach the cluster, no matter which node currently is managing the cluster. Uh, the, the host name will then be kind of the primary way to uh, communicate with the cluster. And you can also provide a secondary IP address of that node, um, because Scanetti typically has at least two networks involved. One network where you reach the nodes and a separate network which only has to work between the nodes for all the replication traffic for disks. You usually want to keep that separate. That's why you provide the information about a secondary IP address. And typically the instances, if they communicate to the outside world, are yet another network. You add nodes. It's also just a command. You again provide the name of the node which has to result to the primary IP address, you provide the second IP address, do that for all the nodes, and then you add an instance. Uh, you provide all the data you need for an instance, so you say, well, which form of storage solution do we use? Typically, so the T is for a disk template, typically DRBD. You specify the size of the disks, or leave the default value, you might provide some tags, and depending on which text you provide, you can, at that level, already say this provides a certain service, and make sure that instances providing the same service don't end up on the same physical node. You give the name of the instance, and you provide the operating system. And Ganetti itself, consider, by design, is to, to manage virtual machines and be agnostic about what did you do with these machines. So the operating system kind of has to come from the outside, and there Ganetti just provides an interface to specify how to get the operating system on the disk of the virtual machine. 
quite simple interface. You have a directory for each OS definitions. You have a couple of scripts, most importantly, a create script that is called over the environment variables to get all the information you need, like the name of the instance, uh, the devices, which will then be the disks of the instance, uh, the number of disks, which devices, size, and etc. And then it's your task to get whatever data you want to get on the disk before actually starting the instance. Uh, a couple of other scripts, some of them are optional. Uh, yeah. So other interaction, as I said, creating a cluster is one thing, maintaining it is another piece of work. Uh, as an example, take a planned maintenance. So we say, well, this node, I want to replace some disk, so I better have it empty beforehand. The way you would do it with Ganetti is you say, you modify the node and you change the status, in this case to drained. So a node can be in one of three possible modes. Online is hopefully the normal mode, the, mode is, the node is just running, Ganetti can reach it and instances are running and everyone is happy. Then there is a node can be offline, meaning, well, offline. Don't even try to connect to that node, but assume that nothing will come out from that node and no instances are running on it. And trained is kind of in between. Technically, the node is fully operational, but it's a policy decision that I intend to get that node empty. In particular, Getty will, Ganetti will not place any new instances on that node. And if you then tell Ganetti to balance the cluster, which is the command hball, it will also consider a um, cluster imbalance where there are instances running on nodes that are planned to get empty. So that will already keep you all the instances away from that. So uh, the name might be a bit confusing. Bal is for balancing. And this H is, well, because it's part of a tool set on top of Ganetti, which are called the H tools for historical reasons. Uh, the commands, well, you tell it, ask the cluster directly to get information about what the current state of the cluster is and actually not tell me how to uh, balance the cluster, but actually carry out the command, execute them. So that will move all the instances away from the node which you marked as trained. Once there's nothing on it, you can tell Ganetti, don't try to connect that node, then you just power it off, do whatever you want to do with the maintenance. Once you're done, you just set it to online again and tell it balance again so that is actually used. Yeah. So that's basic interaction and what happens behind the scenes. And there are things have changed quite a bit since last year, so it might also be interesting for people who attended last year's talk. First of all, these commands which I've shown you, this GNT cluster, modify, blah, 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 they don't do a lot. They're just an inter command line interface, so what they do is they pass the parameters, uh, do some very basic sanity checks, JSON encoded, and over domain socket, uh, give it to the main Ganetti daemon is called Luxy Demon because the protocol it's speaking is Luxy, which is essentially JSON over a Unix domain socket. And then they tell the daemon to do it and then wait for a report on how the job progresses. In fact, you don't even have to wait on the command line. You can just say, well, submit a job. I'll get back later and see what, whether it succeeded or not. So you can just tell it to submit the commands. And with GNT job info, you get information for a specific, a specific job ID that is assigned there. So that's just a simple interface. So the main work is done from the daemon. The first thing it does is it writes the job description to disk uh, so that if the daemon gets restarted and not, no information is lost. And since the whole point of cluster management is to also have some redundancy and be in a good shape, if something goes wrong, uh, it makes sense to also have the Ganetti specific information replicated. So it replicates it to a couple of nodes, which are called master candidates because they have all the information to take over the role of the master should something happen to the actual master. And well, the way it's done, it's on the local disk written directly with the usual write to temp file, f sync, remove, uh, rename and for the remote node, it tells some daemon, please write that file to, to the job. 
here. Then the job is in the status queued, meaning we have it on disk and we're not doing anything on it. And there are several reasons why it can be queued. The main reason is that you want to have a limit on the number of jobs running concurrently on your cluster. That used to be for historical reasons when all the handling was done in one huge multi-threaded Python process and at some points you would hit the limit so better keep the number of threads low. That's no longer the case. But still, you don't want to have too much going on on the master node because typically the master node also hosts instances, so all these operations are going on on DOM0. And all the resources you use for the node are wasted for instances, so normally that's a bit scarce on instances, uh, scarce on resources. Um, but since the resources you donate to your master node is kind of a policy of the administrator, the number of jobs you want to run parallel is also a runtime tunable, at least now. Uh, the other reason is jobs can be more complicated and you can say this job should only be run once another job either finished or even only if the other job succeeded. And if it doesn't succeed, then well, don't even try that job. And you can also have some ad hoc rate limiting, which I will be talking about later. So saying, well, I'm happy with more jobs running, but Jobs of that kind, there should only be a few at the same time. I'll give an example later. So once that's all done, you see, okay, all the prerequisites are met. There's also capacity that we can start a job. Then the job gets forked off as a new process, and the stating is waiting. The reason why you wait is uh, you still might need some logs either because you now manipulate some entity in the real world, like an instance, and you don't want two changes to the instance at the same time, or because you're waiting for resources, because uh, some operations are quite heavy on resources in DOM0, like copying full disk or whatever, and you want to limit that. Again, as DOM0 resources are normally rare. It still talks to needs the configuration to know where an instance is running, which nodes to lock, etc. And since the configuration, well, the configuration in term is just a description of what the, we believe the cluster currently is in, which state it is in, which state it should be in. Uh, since that is accessed by several jobs, which are now processes, um, we have a separate daemon for that, that takes care of the configuration. So it reads the configuration, and all the updates like, oh, I'm waiting for that lock, or the job I'm depending on has actually failed, so I'm not supposed to run. Uh, all these updates are now done by the job themselves. And then the job is in running state, which means it does what it's supposed to do, except that it doesn't do it personally, because you need operations on various nodes, typically not the master node, because one master node, a lot of nodes having instances, Again, the way it works, it contacts the daemon on that node telling him, please create that logical volume, please do that DRBD command, please tell that to the hypervisor, etc. So these are the daemons running with root permissions and just communicating with the jobs. Well, also, if you change something world, we tell that we actually created the disk on purpose and it's not there left over of anything else, so we update the configuration, again, by just calling the appropriate daemon. And then hopefully we're in the state of success. It might go, other statuses could be an error. And there the idea of Garnett is we do one level of error recovery, something goes wrong, we try to undo what we've done before. And if that fails, we just uh, uh, shout out loud and the administrator is supposed to <laughs> pick up the pieces. But normally if you can do something, we can also undo it. Uh, Cancelled is if the administrator says, well, I submitted that job, but I don't want it anymore. Well, then also uh, everyone is happy. So I mentioned uh, ad hoc rate limiting. And before I can talk about that, there's another concept which I have to introduce, and that is the reason trail. Um, it's not quite true what I, well, uh, jobs do, do tasks, but it's not always the case that um, jobs do everything themselves. If you have tasks that can be done or should be done in parallel, then a job just says, well, to do this operation, like verify the cluster, 
just run all the following jobs, which I submit for you, uh, like verify every node group in parallel. Um, other command, typical command that expands to a lot of jobs is node evacuation. You tell Gannett, well, please get this uh, node free of instances because it failed in a hard way. Please uh, start the instances on the corresponding nodes. And then a, that expands to a lot of jobs that can run in parallel, like for every instance you get one job. So jobs can expand to other jobs. And also you have a lot of high-level commands that submit lots of jobs to Ganetti. One we've already seen balancing the cluster that usually involves moving a lot of instances around. And that's all done by submitting more jobs. Oh, Ganetti, you can have other tools on top of Ganetti that, well, either do user management or manage lots of clusters, so it might not be the top layer. And they also submit jobs to Ganetti. And to keep track of what's actually going on or why a particular job was submitted, um, jobs are annotated with reasons why they're executed. Uh, reason is just a list of triples, source, reason, and timestamp. Timestamp is kind of obvious, nanoseconds in the epoch. Uh, source is the tool that added this comment. So typically the tool that submitted the job or the tool that picked up and transformed it. And reason is some human readable text on why we actually want to have this operation on the cluster. And I said every entity that touches a job in some way or another, as the command line, the, the demons taking over, the handing off to other demons, etc., uh, can extend that reason trail. That's why there's a list, and usually they do. Also, if you have a lot of tools before it actually hits Garnetti, then you can also extend the reason trail there. And that's the main point. If, you, if one job expands to a lot of jobs, then the reason trail is inherited. And as I said, uh, sometimes you want to do ad hoc rate limiting. A uh, typical example is you have one node group and you want to send the whole node group to repair or you expect a power down in that data center. Then you want to move all the instances out of that group to a different group. Uh, that's one command, but there's a lot of operation and you want to limit the number of instances being moved simultaneously in order not to overload the switches on top of the node group or something. And that's why a recent addition to Ganetti is saying, well, we can use that reason trail as it's convenient and groups together operations that kind of belong to the same task. Also to do some rate limiting, at least in ad hoc fashion, by having reasons where the name happens to start with rate minus limit colon followed by number, then these form rate limit buckets the whole string forms a rate limit bucket, and you ensure that Galetti will make sure that only n jobs belonging to that reason run together. So a typical example is that you want to evacuate a group, but only move seven instances at the same time, because otherwise we'll have too, low, too much load on the switch. Then you just specify the reason why you're doing it. You start with the magic string rate limit, the number, and then some human readable explanation why you're evacuating the group in the first place, typically a reference to some plant maintenance or to some bug or whatever. That's the reason trail. Um, and kind of more fine-grained job control is going on, is being planned. And see. Other thing I want to talk about is locking. Uh, because there have been some changes as well. And related to talking, the reason, uh, well, to start the story, I start with instance placement. I said one of the tasks of, uh, one of the tasks of Garnetti is to keep the cluster reasonably well balanced. So the same number of instances or same amount of resources used on every node. And best is to already start when adding new instances so that we don't have to do much balancing moves later. And the way to do it is to, again, have an external interface to some program which, so the interface works is you call a program, 
you give a description of the cluster and the instance you want to place on the cluster and send it in, in some trace encoding, and you expect to get out a message saying, well, place the instance here. Ganetti itself already also ships with an instance allocation tool, which is called Hail. Uh, I think it's the most popular one among all Ganetti clusters. And it uses the same notion of balancedness as HBOR, which we've already seen. And by same, I really mainly take the same library. Okay, so that gives, brings us into the realm of locking, because when I plan where to put the instance, I need to be sure that when, uh, once I made the decision, the resources are left on the instance. And so if I want to have a perfect balancedness, I need to lock all nodes that, where I could theoretically put the instance, then see what is the best choice, release the remaining locks, and, well, place the actual instance. Uh, corollary of that, allocation strategy is that all the instances additions are done sequentially because the next instance allocation also says well give me all locks and then I can decide where a good placement is. There already is a solution which has been small improvement, small but hopefully significant improvement later which is opportunistic locking. You can also tell Ganetti well only opportunistically acquire some locks when trying to place the instance so just give me some node locks, and from those I choose where to place the instance. It might not be as balanced, but at least I can create more instances in parallel without waiting for all the locks beforehand. Uh, that, of course, gives me the new form of error that I choose some node locks, find out that none of the nodes I've chosen have enough resources to actually hold the instance. And then I'm not sure whether I can't place the instance on the cluster or not, and I just say, well, try again. Uh, small change, small but important change, recently added, well, we grab some locks, but at least the number of locks we need, at least one node, otherwise I know it won't work, so I wait for at least one node, node being available, or two in the case of DOBD for primary and secondary. And we are planning to also do this retry mechanism internally, saying, but that's kind of future work. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to tell about basic Ganetti operation and locking, and Telga will tell about how to use Ganetti in large scale. So. this work? Okay. Um, yeah, welcome also from my side. Uh, my name is Helga. I will go a bit, um, I will talk a bit about uh, features that are not that well known because we figured we have given a talk last year so we should also tell you something new. And uh, most of the features are more interesting if you run bigger clusters but some already are quite useful if you have a small cluster and want to expand it or want to plan for uh, the next upgrade. So um, one feature that's rather old is our REST API. So we call it RAPI. Um, it, uh, there are client libraries which actually hide the HTTP details so you don't have to deal with the ugly URLs. Um, this is what you use when you have more than one cluster and want to build tools around it that, for example, create uh, several clusters or um, yeah, manage more than one, then you might not only SSH into machines and run the commands on the master node. Um, as Klaus mentioned before, that's actually what we need the, the cluster name for because the RAPI daemon uh, runs on the master node and, if you, and the master node can also fail and we try to keep the cluster running no matter uh, what happens, so you can fail over the master node to another node, and of course then the IP has to be served from that node. And that's why we always use the name, so that uh, you can still uh, access roughly then. Um, one thing, you need um, credentials for it, but only for writing. So uh, if, you use, if you just read something about the state of the cluster, 
uh, then you don't need the credentials. So that means if you run Rapi, you might want to secure your network in a way that, that everybody can read all the data or, or the information of your cluster. Um, this is an example of the Python client that we uh, also ship. Um, so you just import one Python file, and then you uh, create the cluster client. Uh, and in this case, we just want to read something, so we only need the name. Um, there's a standard port which we use uh, if you want to, if you have configured in a way that you want a different port, you can of course have to say it here, otherwise it takes the default. So in this case, we um, want to read the list of instances that we have running and this, the output is some JSON, which is not easy to read. So if you want to have it uh, printed in a nice way, you, yeah, you do some pretty printing here. Um, yeah, as I said, uh, if you just want to read, you don't need credentials, but if you want to write stuff, or if writing means doing any operation which changes the cluster state, like moving instances, uh, changing names, tags, whatever. And uh, this is done like this way, you only you give it the cluster and also the username and password, and then you can do stuff that needs writing. But if you don't want to use the Python client or you want to write your own scripts, you can just do the bare uh, yeah, HTTP stuff. You can use curl or wget or whatever you want. And um, here is an example where you just read the list of nodes from the cluster. And uh, yeah, you get the IDs, uh, so the host names. And you also get an URL. If you want to know more about a particular node, you just can just call uh, the cluster with this URL. Um, and here's an example for a post request where you want to change something. In this case, you want to change the state of a node from, um, from a master candidate to false so that it's not longer a master candidate. And uh, yeah, you need to make a post request, which is kind of ugly if you do it this way. But uh, if you want to write it, for example, in a monitoring script, uh, this is actually uh, quite doable. Yeah, that was about Rapi, and um, we have another tool called HSpace, which is also part of the HTools set. Um, when you run a cluster, at some point you want to do some future planning, so your boss asks you, yeah, we have, I don't know, two more developers coming, they need test machines, Is, do we actually have enough resources on our cluster, or how long will our resources last? And um, HSpace is a way where you, which helps you to do capacity planning on your cluster. And um, it is a tool that simulates resource consumption. So you, uh, it adds new instances, like virtually, uh, till it runs out of resources and it tells you which resource you run out first. It, it uses like internally the same allocation mechanism that you would use in real, if you really would uh, add the instances. And you can um, specify the maximum number of instances that you plan to run. And um, so we start with the biggest instance, uh, add so many as we can, and then get to the next smaller instance, and yeah, until we hit the limits at some point. I have an example here, so you don't read, need to read all of this. So we just run this H space minus L on the master node, and it tells you a bit about your cluster, that it has three nodes, the overall capacity like memory disk and CPU. And um, here it starts adding instances. So it says, OK, I can add four more instances with a bigger disk. And then I still have some space left for two more instances. But then uh, all my disk is filled, and uh, which is here the most likely failure reason. And it also. Uh, tells you the cluster score. That's a metric that tells you how balanced the cluster is. So uh, if it's zero, it means your cluster is perfectly balanced, but that's rare in reality. And here you can see in the end, it's actually, it will be less balanced, but I mean, it depends on the metrics cover not only disk, but also other like CPU and memory. So it can actually be a bit less balanced if you want to really hit the limit. Yeah, and um, here it shows you like, okay, if you hit the disk limit, you still have plenty of RAM. 
So that shows you, you, you should maybe buy more disk and you don't need new nodes, but it might be sufficient to just add more storage. Um, if you, so this works on the cluster uh, master, no, master node, but sometimes you don't have a cluster yet. So you need to set up a new cluster and you want to do the same thing. And therefore, there's a simulation backend which H space, uh, you give it a, a description of an empty cluster, and then you do the same thing. You would specify the instances sizes, and then it tries to fill it up and tells you what resource do you run at first. And um, you can do this for several node groups. So Ganetti has this concept of um, having a partition of different node groups for, for example, different purposes or different user groups or different architectures. And you can do this uh, also in the, in the simulation. So for example, you might have some node group is, um, I don't know, more disk or slower hardware, and you can um, simulate this uh, or uh, include this in the simulation. So for this, you have to give it a description of the cluster, which is kind of, uh, Broad, so this is actually the um, format here. So you have an allocation policy, which is actually on a node group level. So this, you might have a node group that is the preferred um, place for new instances, but you have maybe a last resort node group, which is I don't know some slow computers that are still running somewhere. And if not everything else fails, you use that one. Yeah, you specify the number of nodes, this, or the resources, and. This is what you do here. And then you also have to give it the um, disk template, which means, for example, if you use DRBD, you, of course, need double uh, the amount of storage because you always have a replication. Um, and here you give it the size of the instances. Uh, tiered allocation is a mode where you start with this and like uh, reduce it in steps to uh, at least fit something on it. So, and it does the same thing here, and it, here in this case, you see, I get 33 instances, and then I can add three more with a uh, fewer CPU. And in this case, you see, okay, I run out of CPUs first. Um, another uh, use case that we encountered was, sometimes you want to have virtualization, but not quite all of it. So we have teams that wanted virtual machines but they don't want to share the disk. So they don't want that their virtual machine uh, gets in trouble when some other virtual machine running on the same disk is uh, doing higher overload. So they won't actually not be affected by other services. And um, for this, we you could say, okay, I just give them bare metal and they have only their machine. But of course, you might still want to have the benefits of virtualization. So they might need to a different operating system than your standard uh, operating system, and you still want to be able to migrate it easily, but you still want to make sure that not two virtual machines use the same disk. And um, we call this mode Ganetti Dedicated, and um, it's actually quite easy to set it up in Ganetti. You um, use LVM storage, uh, either plain LVM or DRBD. Um, you have to make sure that not two physical volumes share the same physical device because Ganetti got to sync things in physical volumes. And if you, of course, place two of them on the same disk, it cannot know that you actually did this. And you have to tell Ganetti, okay, I want to use this exclusive storage mode. And if you set it up this way, you, uh, Ganetti will um, change two things. So it will make sure that no two instances run on the same physical uh, volume. And it also respects this if you do any cluster balancing or the capacity planning. So this will be taken into account. And since it's a thing of um, node group level, you can actually have in the same cluster the normal mode or an additional uh, node group with this mode. Um, then another feature. Um, Ganetti historically was developed with the LVM storage in mind, so we actually internally still use DRBD. Um, but in the last years, uh, there was more and more demand for um, shared and distributed storage. Um, there are a few things which we support, like more integrated, like we have a more integrated self-support, or you can just 
like mount some uh, distributed file system uh, on all the nodes and use it as shared storage. But if you want to have, uh, if you have some, I don't know, really cool external storage appliance and you want to, I don't know, for performance reasons, you want to not only mount it somewhere and being let uh, Ganetti totally be agnostic about any features. So, but we cannot possibly uh, support all different appliances with all their uh, complications. So um, we have the X storage interface, which is um, you have to provide a few scripts for your uh, type of appliance, and Ganetti uh, just calls them at the right moment. And um, so for Ganetti, it's a generic way to access uh, external storage, but um, you can use it to do some performance tweaks. And um, yeah, I have some examples here. Um, so it works in a way that you have to provide a few scripts that do the typical operations, which means you create a, an instant disk on that appliance, you grow, remove it, you, and then if you want to actually place the instance, um, you attach or detach it to a node. Um, you might need to set some metadata and you can have additional parameters, as I said, and um, the scripts would like to do some verification that it actually is a valid string or whatever you expect there. And the parameters are actually transmitted by environment variables. This is a similar mechanism to the instance um, OS install scripts uh, that Ganetti already has implemented. So this is an example here. Um, let's say I have two different um, shared storage, one EMC, one IBM storage, and then you can do something like this. You have your normal instance at um, a command. You define as this template that it is an external device, and then you specify the size uh, like for any normal disk, but then you have to tell it which, which provider to use. So this way Ganetti knows which script to run. And this actually works that you can run instances with two disks from two different um, appliances. Um, you can also, I mean, it's, it's actually really well integrated in the, the Ganetti workflow, so you can modify things on the disk, like shrink or grow it, depending if it's supported. Um, you can migrate instances, and uh, since it assumes that all your nodes are connected to this storage, it, it's actually quite easy to migrate nodes and quite fast. And as I said, you can actually add more parameters that Ganetti doesn't know, so it doesn't interpret it in a way, it just uh, forwards it to the uh, provider script. So this is just an example here. Um, yeah, so these were the features that are interesting if you deploy Ganetti at a higher uh, amount of nodes. And uh, I want to go a bit through the, uh, the current development and the future development. So last time, I think we, we were at 2.9, so I start with 2.10. Um, 2.10 is the current version that you get, for example, if you use uh, Debian Wheezy backports. Um, we worked a bit on KVM. There's, uh, there were some contributions to support Hotplug uh, and more direct access to our RDB storage. We improved the cross-cluster move, so you can actually move instances between two cross-clusters, but there were a few problems of performance, and some features were just missing, so this time you can just tell it, okay, move it to this cluster, and it will figure out which node on that cluster to place the instance on, before that you actually had to give it a specific node. And um, it actually can also convert this template on the fly, so we often have the setup that you have some test cluster, and because you don't have so much storage, you just use like plain LVM, and then you want to move a VM to the production cluster, but there you have DRVD. So this kind of conversion shouldn't be too complicated, and, but it was missing so far. Um, then there's this tool HBall that we were talking about, which does the cluster balancing. So far it considered like storage, CPU, and memory, but only the number of CPUs. And this uh, can now be done actually on the, on the CPU load. Um, then another feature is the Ganetti upgrades. I have some extra slides for that. Um, so, so far there were no mechanisms to upgrade the Ganetti software itself. 
And since you have this big setup with many nodes, it's kind of tedious to upgrade the cluster. And many people were kind of frustrated with that because I mean, you don't want to take your whole cluster down. And I mean, the risk with that. And we uh, try to make this more easy. So this is like the old way. So you have to stop the Ganetti demons. That means actually your instances continue running, but if anything fails, of course, Ganetti is not there to fix it. And um, then you install the new packages. You have to con um, update the uh, configuration. You have to restart all Ganetti services. And then you have to redistribute the configuration. And then depending on different versions, you have to do a lot more steps. And if everything goes wrong, there was no way to get back easily. So you had to fix this manually. And from 2.10 on, you can use the Ganetti upgrade command. And um, so that means the earliest that you can use it to upgrade to is from 2.10 to 2.11. And this works like that. So you have the fget install your, your new packet or whatever distribution you use. And then you just say GNT cluster upgrade and then the version you want to upgrade to. And if something goes wrong, you can actually use the upgrade to downgrade as well to the previous version. The current stable version of Kennedy is 2.11, which is uh, available in Debian Jesse. Um, we worked on RPC security, so we use some internal RPC protocol for the master node to talk to the um, other nodes. And uh, so far, the, it was not that uh, secure because all nodes use the same certificate. That means if you have this certificate from one compromised node, you can actually pretend to be the master node and do evil things. So now there's some uh, improvement that you have individual certificates and not just every certificate will be accepted. Um, for the instance moves that are the cross cluster instance moves, you, uh, we have now compression for, I don't know, uh, slow network. Uh, setups. Um, you can now configure SSH ports and not only the, the standard port. We have um, cluster support now integrated. So uh, this is still flagged experimental, which is, I mean, it's fairly new and we don't have so much uh, feedback yet from real life uh, setups. So if you want to try this out, we're happy to get any feedback on this. And there's another tool, H squeeze and the H tools um, uh, tool set. Um, which was also uh, requested from an external user. Um, so when you have a cluster that has a high fluctuation in load, so for example, you might have a cluster that has um, virtual machines for your developers to test, but your developers are just in one time zone, so when they go home at night, the machines are actually idling. Or you have um, a setup where you only need a lot of virtual ma machines, like, I don't know, a few days, uh, every couple of weeks because you release some updates or something like that and otherwise you don't actually need that many instances. So what we wanted to do is um, whenever there's low times of load you can shut down some instances and move the remaining instances to a few nodes to use as, them as best as possible and really physically shut down the remaining nodes. So you save some money or some energy for the environment. And for this, to, to make it more easy to uh, move them together and then know what, which nodes to shut down, you can use this crew edge squeeze. So it's actually huddling your instances together. And um, so this is a bit contrary to the cluster balancing, which usually tries to like balance it uh, fairly equally on all nodes. But this is like, OK, packing as many as I can on a few nodes and, re, and re, uh, shutting down the rest. So it, it creates a migration plan for the instances. And um, of course, this works better with shared storage because if you use DRBD, you would actually need to move uh, the storage, and that would take too long. Um, so it drains as many nodes as possible, but not too many because you don't want to like have any impact on the remaining instances. So you don't want like all of a sudden not have enough RAM or something. And um, it uses HBAR to calculate the load of the, the few nodes that stay on. Uh, in 2.11, only the planning was implemented. So it actually just gives you a list of 
things to do, um, but you still have to do it yourself. But in 2.13, you can just say, okay, please cluster, uh, move my instances according to this plan, and then you uh, need to shut the nodes down. And of course, if you want to use this, you have to make sure that your remaining environment deals with this properly. So like your monitoring system shouldn't get alarmed when you shut down the machines, etc. That of course you have to take care of as well. Um, two more features. So uh, we have been asked a lot if we have Alexi support, and so far it was always ex um, it existed, but it was flagged as experimental. And the reason was we also didn't have many users, and so we didn't know how like mature it is. And this year we take, took part in Google Summer of Code, which I hope everybody knows, but it's maybe not. Um, Google gives some money to students that work on open source projects over the summer, and they have to like implement a reasonably sized feature. And this, uh, we had a student who worked on the LXE support to make sure it actually works, to find any bugs, to set up a QA that properly tests this for us, so whenever we now do something, we see actually when it breaks. And uh, it works with LXC 1.0. It will probably be released into 13, so a bit in the future. And the live migration is still experimental, um, which was due to some limitations in LXC. Um, another Google Sum of Code project that we have, that Ganetti now supports all these different types of storage, but um, it was not that always that easy to convert between the storage, uh, storage templates. And we had a student who worked on that to convert more directions. And it's also going well. We will release it in 2013. There's uh, the future. So this is things we work on or like to work on in the future. So um, as Klaus already mentioned, we did some stuff in the job queue. There are some more plans here. We want to get the network part more um, flexible and especially better to work with IPv6. Um, we work more on the shared storage part because that's obviously a very growing area of interest. Um, we have some interest in heterogeneous clusters. Per se, actually, Ganeti can work with heterogeneous um, setups, but uh, it was not technically uh, tested for it very well. So. Um, Whenever somebody has a complaint about this, like if you only have like three very different machines and something doesn't work, we would like to know about this. And um, yeah, we work, continue working on the cross-cluster instance moves and some improvement on the SSH key handling as well. And with that, I'm done. Um, you can check our project uh, if you just Google for Ganetti, and we are the first hit, but we did not manipulate that. And <laughs> usually we list the number of conferences that we go to, but this year is not that much anymore. Next week we are on, in Portland on a small Ganetti conference, also our own home conference. And uh, yeah, that's it from my side. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> Questions? So far, nobody has asked for it, but I was kind of expecting the... Oh, yeah, uh, the question was if we have any intention to use Docker. And um, so far, we haven't any requests yet. But I mean, I guess as with LXC at some point, we might uh, integrate that. <laughs> you have to speak up, but sorry. <laughs> More questions. Um, how large is your external uh, contributor contributor base? Uh, that's a good question. I think we never really, I don't know, got any numbers, right? I mean, if you if you want. To. So the question was about the size of the external contributor base. Uh, looked recently at the commits. Majority still comes from people working at Google. There are kind of two big groups that are contributing. One is GNET, a um, company providing infrastructure for the Greek academic community. Uh, they use a lot of KVM, so 
lot of KVM related um, patches actually are contributed from them. Also, GNT network is a big part of them. So, um, I think size patch, if you just count patches, about I think 10% or so. And another big external computer contributor is um, Apollon, who is the Debian maintainer for the Gennady package. And it's quite a good relation because if he finds something is not working in his setup, he also sends patches and he tests very well also the KVM, LVM setup, I think, uh, because he's using it himself. But roughly, I think 80 or 90% of all patches come from people working at Google, not necessarily the core team. A lot of people do internships and then work on Ganetti. Um, also, within Google, some people use 20% of their time to contribute to Ganetti. Uh, the question was whether we would recommend using Ganetti for small, and the suggestion was four to six node clusters. Um, we are using it ourselves for such small clusters, typically in offices to provide name server and similar basic infrastructure. So yes, we use it ourselves for small clusters. Also, people report that one of the reasons why they use Ganetti is that it's easy to get started even on a small cluster and use it. And it scales to, to big clusters as well. What is the biggest cluster of you, what you are doing? How much you um, The question was? So the question was, what the biggest clusters uh, that we know of? I'm, we, we actually will release some numbers next week. So I think the biggest we have internally is like a couple of, like, I don't know, 100 nodes maybe, and it runs 1,300 instances. So that's, but we have several clusters then total. Uh, from externally, I don't know. I don't have any numbers right now. Yes? We have uh, also a network tool like GNT Network that does some stuff, um, but uh, we don't. We, we are aware of that it's not that sophisticated yet. But um, yeah, that's equivalent part. There's this network stuff. Uh, I just chose some topics here, of course, and I couldn't go into detail of that. Yeah. More questions? Okay. So thank you, and if you have more questions, you can mail on our mailing list or yeah, IRC channel. Thank you.